Hello, everyone, and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host, Stuart Blues, and this is the 10th and final episode of Season 5. I'm ending the season with a debatable murder mystery case that had me trawling through hundreds of old newspaper articles. It's a tragic yet fascinating story that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Before we get into it, let's break the ice as we always do. The show's first opening icebreaker segment is this. Welcome to Daddy Facts. And here is this week's Dad Fact. The first speeding ticket in the UK was handed out in 1896 to a man driving 8 miles an hour. What a boy racer. 8 miles an hour. You probably would get a ticket, a low speeding ticket. You can go too slow. The second and final opening icebreaker segment is this. The Serial Killer's Book of Haiku. And here is this week's haiku. Knife hacks through bone. Blood oozes. Painstaking hard work. Clearing up my mess. A haiku is a Japanese poem made up of 17 syllables in three lines of 5, 7 and 5. It's also meant to be read in one breath. There's a link to the Serial Killers book of Haiku 2 where I get these from. It's by Rose Bundy. The link is in the episode description if you're interested in buying it. If you want to send me a haiku, I'm probably going to start doing some of my own next season because that book is done as was the first one. Send me them in. I had a great response last time I did that. I'll write some of my own. Let's just keep the opening icebreakers fun and just sets the tone a little bit, doesn't it? But with my intro waffle complete, let's get into this week's episode. This case was suggested by listener Jay Barnes back in September 2021. We're in the Wirral this week, a peninsula in northwest England. Within said peninsula, we're in Jay's hometown shipburg of Heswall. Jay's words, not mine. It has a population of 13,401, according to the 2011 census. Now, this week, Jay actually provided me with the five quickfire facts about the Wirral, the peninsula as a whole. They've all been fact-checked, of course, by myself. So here we go. Number one, a fair few celebrities were born in the town of Heswall. I'm probably saying that wrong. Heswall, Hes... I don't know how else you could say it. But the celebrities born there include... Radio DJ John Peel, former cricketer Ian Botham, and TV personality Jim Bowen. Jim Bowen, if you remember, hosted Bullseye, the dart show, and that's the show that John Cooper, the Bullseye Killer, featured on, and that case I covered in episode 4 of season 1 of British Murders. Fact number 2. Before sailing to Ireland for the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, William III stayed at 17th century country house Gayton Hall, the home of the Glegg family. His army were garrisoned at Chester and had to march the 20 miles there and back to Hoy Lake, which is on the North Wirral coast, at least five times before the tides were favourable for the journey to Carrick Fergus. William Glegg got a knighthood for his trouble. Number three, Birkenhead is known as the One-Eyed City. Apparently nobody knows why, not a nickname I'd want for my city. And Birkenhead Park was the first publicly funded civic park in the world. Opening in 1847, it was the model on which New York City's Central Park was based, and it ran the first street tramway in Europe, which was the brainchild of Mr. George Francis Train. Number four, famous Birkenhead alumni include poet and soldier Wilfred Owen, mountaineer Andrew Irvine, thought to be the first person to climb Everest that can't ever be proved, and actress and politician Glenda Jackson. Number five, the Wirral is believed to be the site of the Battle of Brunnenburg in 937 CE. The battle is often cited as the point of origin for English nationalism and is one of the bloodiest battles in British history. When suggesting cases, feel free to offer up some quick fire facts. It saves me a job. I will read them out after a little bit of fact checking. The timeline this week is going to follow a slightly different format. Because this is kind of a murder mystery case, I'm going to tell you the timeline of events first and then work backwards. We start on Sunday, October 9th, 1983. 
and Culture Club's Karma Chameleon was spending its fourth week at the top of the UK's official singles chart. In what has been described as a luxury bungalow on peaceful Buffs Lane, 50-year-old Cynthia Bolshaw was expecting a morning visit from her sister and brother-in-law. As the married couple arrived that morning at around 10.30am, they had no idea their world was about to be turned upside down. Noticing that the curtains were still drawn and Cynthia's red Toyota Corolla was missing from the driveway, they knew something was seriously wrong. After letting themselves in the house and making their presence known, no response was received. The house was quiet. After a brief search of the bungalow's rooms, a grim discovery was made in the bathroom. Cynthia Bolshaw was floating face down in bathwater approximately 18 inches deep. She had nothing on except some ear studs, a neck chain and a gold bangle. This case is commonly referred to as the beauty in the bath, the reasons for which will become clear shortly. One thing I would like to address before I carry on is that I was a bit disappointed with a lot of the coverage this case has received regarding Cynthia's appearance and sex life. It feels like this case is so well known for all the wrong reasons, that being Cynthia's good looks and the amount of sexual partner she had. My aim is to tell her story in an unbiased way without judgment or preconceptions, and I hope that comes across. Working backwards, it appears as if Cynthia Bolshaw was born in 1933. I tried to figure out her precise date of birth, but my efforts weren't rewarded. I know she was born in Liverpool located a stone's throw away from the Wirral, across the River Mersey, and her parents were Elsie and Charles Wilson. The youngest of four children, Cynthia and her family moved to the town of West Kirby, located on the northwest corner of the Wirral, where they ran a bookshop. Cynthia married a man named James Bolshaw at some point during the 1950s, and the marriage lasted about a decade or so before they got divorced in 1963. James Balshaw, or Captain James Balshaw, as I should call him, was in the Royal Air Force, and the couple had one child, a son who they named Christopher. Conflicting articles confirmed Christopher as being either 24 or 26 at the time of his mum's death, which puts him as being born in either 1957 or 1959, or somewhere in between. Christopher attended a primary school in the Wirral village of Burton, where they lived, before attending Birkenhead School in Oxton and later graduating from Manchester University. Like his dad, Christopher would join the RAF where he became a navigator. The Bolshaw family home in Burton overlooked the picturesque de Estre in marshes, that's hard for me to bloody say, something which led to her neighbours questioning her decision to move to Heswall in March 1983. One theory is that Cynthia's arthritis was becoming too painful, and her passion for gardening was suffering as a result. Moving somewhere with a lower maintenance garden may well have played a factor in Cynthia's decision-making process. With Cynthia at the bungalow in Heswell was her pet cat, Gomez, and prior to that her son Christopher until he left home to join the RAF. Described by those who knew her as friendly, extroverted and endearing, Cynthia was popular with everyone she came in contact with, she had such a vast network of contacts that she kept a total of 17 diaries at her house, each of which was full of phone numbers belonging to all manner of people she'd come across in her life. The diaries also contained the numbers of several male contacts, but we'll get into that later. For work, Cynthia joined former department store Browns of Chester in April 1976 as a cosmetics consultant for... Gurlain? <laughs> Gurlain? I'm guessing that's some kind of high-end fashion design. I'm not a fashion person. Browns was apparently referred to as the Harrods of the North back in the day. She left that job in August 1979, opting to work for a company based in the North Wales town of Wrexham. She rejoined Browns in July 1980, before leaving again in December 1982, that time she left to become either a receptionist at the Parkgate Hotel or a barmaid at the Victoria Hotel. Maybe she did both. Regardless, she returned home to Browns in August 1983, two months before her death, working again as a cosmetics consultant, but this time for Christian Dior. That one I can pronounce. On October 1st, 1983, 
just over a week removed from Cynthia's body being found, Christopher Balshaw married his fiancée, Gaynor, at Barnston Parish Church in Heswall, now known as Christ Church Barnston. Cynthia attended the wedding and was delighted at seeing her only child tie the knot with the love of his life. How, then, could such a wonderful moment in Cynthia's life be followed a week later by her death? Was it suicide? A tragic accident? Nope. It was secret answer number three. Cynthia Balshaw had been murdered. After her sister and brother-in-law found her body in the bath, the police were soon called. It didn't take long to come to the conclusion that Cynthia had not died as a result of drowning. She was already dead when she was placed in the avocado green bath. Detective Superintendent Jim Owens, who was head of Birkenhead CID at the time, said, Death was due to asphyxia, but she certainly did not drown, and we are not looking for a weapon. The indications are that she died in the house, but there were no obvious signs of a struggle. There are indications that she had been entertaining that evening, because drinks were on the table. The drinks in question were brandy and sherry, and there didn't appear to be any signs of a sexual assault. After finishing her shift at Brown's on Saturday, October 8th, 1983, the evening before her body was found, Cynthia dropped a colleague off at home at approximately 6.20pm and arrived home herself at around 6.30pm. She told her colleagues that she was having a relatively quiet evening that night, which a search of the house by police confirmed. Cynthia's clothes were neatly folded by her bed. Glasses were out as well as the aforementioned drinks. There were no signs of forcible entry. Nothing appeared to have been stolen. All signs led to the fact that Cynthia must have known her killer well enough to invite them in for drinks. But if the cause of death was asphyxia prior to Cynthia's body being placed in the bath, why did her killer bother to do that? The simple and most obvious explanation is that her killer wanted it to appear as if Cynthia had killed herself. The house was then wiped clean. I mentioned earlier that Cynthia kept several diaries containing the details of numerous contacts, both men and women. That was a key piece of evidence for the police, and it gave them the first lead. Detective Superintendent Jim Owens said, She will be known by a lot of people, and we believe she had lots of friends. We are anxious that anyone who knew her should contact us, and any information will be dealt with in strictest confidence. Cynthia's red Toyota Corolla was last spotted on her drive at 11.30pm on the evening of October 8th, but by the following morning, it had disappeared. It was later found abandoned in a field gateway near the Thingwall garage. PC Dick Perks, who was based in the rural town of Neston, spotted the car on his way to work at 5.45am on October 9th. The car had practically a full tank of petrol and its keys were in the ignition. Clearly, Cynthia's killer had used this as a getaway car, but for some reason, abandoned the idea during their escape. Detective Superintendent Jim Owens said, We would also like to hear from anyone who may have seen Mrs. Bolshaw's car being driven along the Chester High Road on Saturday night or Sunday morning, or who may have seen it parked in the field gateway about 200 yards on the Heswall side of Thingwall Garage. As house-to-house -house searches began, a number of male callers made contact with the police control room, which was being manned by Merseyside Police's Serious Crime Squad. Detective Superintendent David Olson, deputy head of Merseyside CID, tried to convince more people to come forward by promising the utmost discretion. As a team of 80 officers were combing through Cynthia's many diaries to find new names and leads, Detective Superintendent David Olson said, a number of male associates have come forward and have been eliminated in a confidential manner from our inquiries, but there are still numerous persons to be interviewed. I would urge them to come forward in confidence and contact either Detective Superintendent Jim Owens or myself on the murder hotline at Bevington Station. Let me now introduce you to an unknown individual known simply as The Running Man. Described by two witnesses as a 30-year-old male running across the Two Mills Road away from Heswall and towards Chester, this mystery running man did not look like a jogger out for a midnight practice run. It was between 12.30am and 1am on the morning of October 9th that he was spotted, and he certainly wasn't wearing clothes suitable for an early morning jog. 
Where he was spotted is also crucial, as it was about a mile and a half away from where Cynthia's car was found abandoned. A second mystery man was described to police on October 13th, 1983, as someone who had an uncomfortable obsession with Cynthia. Guessed to be around 60, twice the age of the running man, the white-haired male was said to regularly visit Browns of Chester on Fridays to stare at Cynthia as she worked. Police had more to go on with this person, as they were also informed he was 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 8, had a medium build with an oval face, he wore an anorak or a green nylon parka, he carried a two compartment shoulder bag and had a speech impediment. He also wore what was described as a distinctive hearing aid. What made it so distinctive? I've no idea. One of Cynthia's colleagues informed the police that he had once asked her for Cynthia's phone number and it wasn't long before this white-haired mystery man was found. It only took the police two days to bring him in for questioning. They did the obvious thing and paid a visit to Browns of Chester. A man matching the description they'd been given was there on October 15th, 1983, and he was subsequently taken in and interviewed at Bebbington Police Station. Police quickly dismissed this man as the killer, and he was soon sent home, though he did admit he was a big admirer of Cynthia. He'd heard the description of himself when the police said who they wanted to speak to, but he didn't put two and two together and realised that they were talking about him. On the same day the police took in the 60-year-old admirer for questioning, it was revealed that three jewellery items taken from Cynthia's home had been handed in to Greater Manchester Police on October 11th, 1983. The three items in question were Cynthia's almost two and a half grand engagement ring, her wedding ring, that had been remodelled into a wishbone ring and a wristwatch. They were found in a telephone box in Stockport, a town in Greater Manchester located 50 miles east of Heswall. They'd been wrapped in one of Cynthia's nylon stockings prior to being dumped. By October 17th, 1983, police described a third person they wanted to speak to regarding Cynthia. On one Sunday in mid-September 1983, this 50-55 to year old male was said to have visited Beresford and Adams estate agents at Chester Cross with Cynthia. The pair were asking questions regarding the availability of bungalows in the Chester district of Handbridge, but were informed that the agents had nothing of the sort on their books at the time. The male was said to be short but stocky, with broad shoulders, a round face and no facial hair. He had short, grey, receding hair and silver-framed glasses. To make this story even more convoluted, it was then revealed that a car very similar to Cynthia's, with a lady stood by it who very much looked like Cynthia, was spotted on Tuesday, October 4th, 1983. The location was the side of the A540 Chester High Road, and the time was 7.30pm. That was three days after Christopher married Gaynor and five days before Cynthia's body was found. Next to Cynthia's car, or rather the car that looked like Cynthia's car, was a bronze metallic Mercedes-Benz S-Class saloon with a Y-suffixed registration plate. The apparent owner of said car was a six-foot-tall, well-built 40-50-year-old to 50 year old male with short, dark hair. You've probably worked it out by now that Cynthia had a lot of male friends. By October 20th, 1983, the police had called at 290 houses in total and interviewed 649 people in the immediate vicinity of Cynthia's house. Gaining essentially nothing, they decided to extend the search area. I'm not just talking about a bigger area of Heswall either. Interpol were asked to make inquiries with several foreign police forces, including those based in Germany, Dubai, Tokyo, New York, Uganda and France. By Halloween 1983, hopes of finding Cynthia's killer had stalled until one phone call from an anonymous person came through to the telephone incident room at Bebbington Police Station. The details of the call aren't readily available, but the police confirmed the information provided was vital to the case. It was so vital that Detective Superintendent Jim Owens publicly said, I am willing to meet the person at any time or place at their convenience. Despite that appeal, the caller would go quiet until ringing back on November 8th, 1983. During that week or so of no contact, 
the police were busy conducting house-to-house -house searches at 500 properties in the Wirral village of Ness, five miles south of Heswall. During that second anonymous phone call, the mystery caller, the gender of whom was withheld by police, explained that the information they provided in the first call does not, in their opinion, make them a key witness. The police disagreed, of course, and again appealed to the caller to ring back once more to discuss things further. More calls were received during the entire month of November 1983, with them ceasing on November 30th. The following day, December 1st, 1983, a 36-year-old woman named Gloria Holmes of Salford, Greater Manchester, appeared before magistrates at Birkenhead after being accused of wasting over a hundred hours of police time. Not only had Gloria made numerous phone calls to the police regarding the case, she'd also made a false report showing she had information concerning the murder inquiry. It wasn't clear as to whether this was the same person who made the vital anonymous calls, but the dates add up, and it's only logical to assume it was the same person. Gloria was remanded on bail until January 25th, 1984, with her bail conditions being that she was not allowed to enter a phone box until her next court date. She was eventually handed a two-year probation order, with the condition that she undergo psychiatric treatment. Her reason for wasting so many hours of police time was because she was bored and lonely. By mid-January 1984, the police had managed to track down 200 of Cynthia's male friends, with a further 100 yet to be traced. The telephone incident room had logged 4,000 phone calls and taken 1,200 plus statements. On January 13th, 1984, Cynthia Bolshaw's funeral was conducted by the Venerable H. Leslie Williams at Barnston Parish Church, the same place her son got married a week before her death. It was attended by 40 people, including her son Christopher and her daughter-in-law Gaynor. The next time Cynthia's case was in the news was in November 1989, almost six whole years after her funeral. It was reported on November 1st, 1989, that a key factor had surfaced that, up until then, hadn't before. Almost 10 fresh leads came in from members of the public after watching a newsgroup special investigation on the case. Frustratingly, details of the new leads could not be released on the grounds of confidentiality but the police believed that Cynthia's killer was being shielded by their family and friends. Another year went by with no new leads, and as a result, a special hotline was opened in October 1990 in the hope that somebody would come forward with something the police could use to further the investigation. Nothing sufficient was received. In February 1992, two separate prisoners, a man and a woman, were interviewed in connection with the case. Detective Inspector John Parry said, We met a man for about two hours, and he gave us some information which could be very valuable. Regular meetings are still held to examine new evidence, but many of the original detectives have moved elsewhere or retired. Regarding the female prisoner interviewed, she revealed that she had provided an alibi for one of the men interviewed by police back in 1983. Serving time for a completely unrelated offence, the prisoner said she did not spend the evening with the man in question, despite her saying so in her original statement. Despite the influx of potential new leads, nothing came of either interview. It wasn't until early 1999, almost 16 years after Cynthia's murder, that things started to progress with the investigation. A press conference was held on March 17, 1999, during which the police announced their latest findings relating to the Beauty in the Bath case. Due to advances in DNA technology, forensic experts had managed to obtain a full genetic fingerprint of an as-yet-unidentified male who was now their prime suspect. As they had done previously, all of Cynthia's former male friends and lovers were urged to come forward and offer their DNA to discount themselves from the investigation. They were also warned to contact the police before the police contacted them, as that would only make things worse. Within a month of that press conference, the police had someone in custody who they believed was the one responsible for murdering Cynthia Bolshaw. 49-year-old double glazing salesman John Edwin Taft was arrested on April 15, 1999 at his home in Birkenhead. Born on December 21, 1949, 
John Taft didn't have the best of childhoods. He had two siblings, but both of his parents were said to have been alcoholics. In August 1973, John met Barbara Cragg through a dating agency magazine, and the pair got married six months later on February 22, 1974. John and Barbara divorced in June 1988, and it was his ex-wife that put forward his name to the police. Barbara explained that John told her he was at Cynthia's house on October 8, 1983, the night she died, and that he'd asked her to provide him with an alibi should the police come knocking at their door. In fairness, Barbara refused to do that. However, the police never called around to speak with her. On the back of Barbara's testimony, John agreed to provide a sample of his blood, and it was from that sample that forensic experts extracted his DNA. John's DNA profile matched that of semen found on Cynthia's black nightdress. John was questioned at a Merseyside police station for 309 minutes over two days, and at first he denied having murdered Cynthia. As the questioning progressed, though, he started responding to every question with no comment. John was only a week removed from marrying his second wife, Susan, at Birkenhead Register Office on March 29th, 1999. He wasn't long back from Paris, where the newlyweds had spent their honeymoon. During the initial investigation, John was spoken to by the police around four weeks after the murder, after they found a letter from his employer, Birkenhead Glass. He explained that away as simply being a business thing, and said it was the responsibility of the customer to send them their double glazing measurements. The company would then send a letter with an estimate, which is what John said that was. He had also left a business card from Birkenhead Glass at Cynthia's house that was found in one of her drawers. What's crucial here is that John Taft clearly knew Cynthia. He'd been in contact with her in relation to her double glazing at the very least, and the fact a semen stain was found on a negligee that matched his DNA suggests he knew her far more personally. On April 17th, 1999, John Taft was formally charged with Cynthia's murder, and he appeared at Wirral Magistrates Court in Birkenhead later that day. Over the next seven months, John and his legal team would make frequent appearances at Wirral Magistrates Court, and he would be denied bail in excess of five times. His trial finally began on November 10th, 1999 at Liverpool Crown Court, with Recorder of Liverpool Judge David Clark QC overseeing the proceedings. John vehemently denied the murder charge, but case prosecutor Andrew Edis QC theorised the chain of events on that fateful October night. He believed that John visited Cynthia at her home, they had sex, for some reason he strangled her, placed her body in her bath to make it look like a suicide or an accident, stole some of her jewellery, and then drove away in her car to make it look like she'd been robbed. Once the car had been ditched, John lived locally in Lower Heswell, so couldn't be seen dropping the car off at his house, he thought to have walked these seven or so miles home along a disused railway line. When he got home, he destroyed the sweater, jeans and shoes he was wearing. At the time of Cynthia's murder, Barbara was away studying at Sussex University, so she had no idea what was going on until she returned home. After abandoning Cynthia's jewellery in the Stockport phone box on either the Monday or Tuesday following that weekend, John asked Barbara to give him an alibi, as he'd been at Cynthia's house the night she was murdered and didn't want the police to think he was involved. In court, Barbara said, He asked me, if I was interviewed by police, to tell them I was at home when the murder was committed. I told him I was not prepared to do so. He was doing a foreigner at Mrs. Bolshaw's home, and I gained the impression that he was there in the afternoon and into the early evening. He said Mrs. Bolshaw was distressed. She was crying because of an injured eye, and John told me he'd comforted her. The term I use there, doing a foreigner, that means to complete a piece of work done for private gain, i.e. without your employer's or the taxman's knowledge, cash in hand as it were. Another witness in this case was John's next door neighbour, Joan Evans, who recalled seeing John burying something in his back garden in the middle of the night in early October 1983. She said, I think it was at the beginning of October. He had his back to me and it looked like he was filling in a hole which was about 18 inches square. It was just before midnight and it was dark. I saw the outline of either a spade or a shovel. There was a light on a box, but I could not see if it was a torch. He patted everything smooth 
and then went into the house. A year after the murder, John sold his house in Lower Heswall to a landscape gardener named Stephen Round. The back garden was ridiculously overgrown, and Stephen ended up installing a fish pond on the spot where Joan Evans had seen John digging. Stephen recalled finding a round knitted garment that had started to rot whilst digging the fish pond's foundations. It was about 8 inches by 6 inches, but Stephen threw it away as he believed it was nothing more than a piece of rubbish. In court, it was also revealed that in the days leading up to a murder, there'd been several sightings of Cynthia and John together at the Hotel Victoria, where she worked as a barmaid. Five days into the trial, it unexpectedly stalled. The prosecution wanted more time for forensic scientists to re-examine exhibits using the latest techniques. When the trial recommenced on November 17th, 1999, the jury were told that the chances of the semen found on Cynthia's nightdress not being John Taft's were 160 million to one. Forensic scientist Roy Green said, The test provided extremely strong evidence that the semen originated from Taft rather than someone related to him. The chances of gaining such a match from anyone else are one in 160 million. The following day, November 18th, 1999, John Taft finally admitted to knowing Cynthia and explained the pair had had consensual sex on October 8th, 1983. He still denied having murdered her though. According to John, he arrived at Cynthia's bungalow at 8.55pm. They made their way to the bedroom and had sex on top of the bed. Once finished, Cynthia put a dressing gown over her black negligee and the pair had a few drinks before John left at 10.30pm. He said he got home at 10.45pm and that Cynthia was in good spirits when he left. When cross-examined regarding the digging of a hole in his back garden, John said he was putting scraps of food out for the garden wildlife. Four days later, on November 22, 1999, the jury was sent home after failing to agree a verdict after three and a half hours of deliberating. Another six hours of deliberating led to no verdicts being agreed on November 23, 1999, which resulted in Judge David Clark saying he would accept a majority verdict. Ideally, he wanted a unanimous one, but a 10 to 2 or 11 to 1 majority would now also be accepted. The next day, November 24th, 1999, John Taft was found guilty of Cynthia's murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. The jury had indeed come to a majority verdict, with 10 jurors finding him guilty and two jurors finding him not guilty. In his closing statement, Judge David Clark said, Why you killed her will never be known except by you. What is clear is that you kept quiet for 16 years and never told the truth about what took place that night. You are an intelligent and calculating man who, as far as I can see, has never shown any remorse. As he was led away from the dock, John turned to his second wife and said, I love you. You know the truth, Sue. On November 25th, 1999, Susan Taff said, I have never doubted my husband's innocence. I know he did not do it. I know John is innocent. I will do everything I can to help John. John's legal team officially lodged an appeal on December 13th, 1999. He was adamant he hadn't killed Cynthia and spent the evening in the hospital wing of Walton Prison after receiving his sentence due to having a breakdown. The Court of Appeal ruled that there was no evidence to demonstrate the judge's words had altered the course of the jury's deliberations and were insufficient to order a retrial. After that, there's not much information out there. As far as I can tell, John Taft was released from prison a fair few years ago. I couldn't see any minimum term he was given, only that he was handed a life sentence, which, as we all know, rarely means life. This case will forever legally be classed as a murder committed by a double glazing salesman, but the sad truth is that we may never know if that was the whole truth, or if John was wrongly sent down for a crime he didn't commit. And that was the story of Cynthia Bolshaw, known forever as the Beauty in the Bath. Thanks again to Jay Barnes for suggesting this case. I'd love to hear what you all think of it. Is it an open and shut case? Did John Taft murder Cynthia Bolshaw? Or was it a gross miscarriage of justice that saw an innocent man sent to prison for several years based on being in the wrong place at the wrong time? I've got three new reviews to read out this week. Thank you firstly, Apple Podcast user Zifthead for leaving British Murders a five-star rating and review. They said, 
I'm from Sheffield and I've seen every episode. Love the accent and I like the way you present. Keep it up. Thank you, Katie, for leaving British Murders a five-star rating and review on BritishMurders.com. Katie said, love this podcast, found it in 2021 and have binged it. Short and to the point without missing facts. Highly recommend. This one might be a bit longer though. And finally, thank you Apple Podcast user Marie H. 1973 for leaving British Murders a five-star rating and review. Marie said, very concise and to the point. Stuart doesn't ramble and gets the job done. Great research and even better accent. Good to hear some more unknown British crimes. Thanks again, Zift Head, Katie and Marie. Suppose you'd like to leave a review of the show and have it read on a future episode. You can do so on iTunes, Facebook, Podchaser or BritishMurders.com. You can also leave star ratings on Spotify and voicemail messages on BritishMurders.com. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or donate on a one-off basis via Buy Me A Coffee, you can find the links for each of those at the website. Please continue to email your case suggestions to BritishMurdersPodcast at gmail.com or message me via social media. I have got a little bit of a backlog, but I will get round to them all. I've got a little spreadsheet set up. If you do recommend a case, you'll not only get it covered, but you'll also get a cheeky shout out. That's it for now. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.